जो आई मीन वैक्सीनेटेड द एंटायर पॉपुलेशन ऑन इट्स अ वेरी कंबरसम वर्क दैट मे टेक अनदर 2 3 इयर्स प्रोबेबली दिस रिप्रोडक्शन इन इंडिया या इट्स वेरी densely populated so i believe we still got around a couple of minutes so you don't mind i'm going to get a drink and then i'll come back and get ready okay okay sure all right i'll be back shortly Uh, excuse me sujata ma'am uh, yes uh, yes tell me uh, dr doble here okay uh, ma'am uh, can i know where sorry your voice you are not audible hello Uh, can can you hear me ma'am please yeah yeah tell me hello is it yes okay. yes you are uh, ma'am as per communication uh, this feedback link uh, as per the communication the feedback yes. link is going to share today uh, can i know uh, we will share it uh, just after last last session after uh, ganapati pandal session okay okay fine 10 minutes before Fine, fine, thank you. Fine, fine, okay, thank, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much.
yeah i guess we can start yes good morning everyone so welcome back to our second session so before starting our session let me welcome professor uh, fong uh, professor chunche lands fong uh, we extend a warm welcome to our north orissa university which is located at the northern part of orissa odisha is one of the uh, state of india and uh, of course we are virtually we are meeting each other but uh, this state is and this particular place is very uh, beautiful having lot of scenic beauty and uh, the main uh, attraction of this place is we have a uh, simli pal biosphere Uh, which is very near to this place maximum 20 to 25 to 30 kilometers away so if in future if you uh, get a chance to visit uh, odisha particularly india don't uh, i mean um, uh, forget to visit our university uh, definitely will enjoy this place uh, okay so i'll give you a so small very short introduction about you and after that you can start your lecture sir thank you so professor chun che lands fon currently working as emeritus professor murdak university perth australia he graduated with a bsc degree with first class honors and a ma degree from the university of wales his phd degree was awarded by the university of western australia with a thesis on artificial intelligence and power system engineering he has supervised 31 doctoral students and published over 334 academic articles his contributions can be viewed at iwe explore research gate google scholar etc and his motto is learning has no boundary so now we are going to prove that so welcome sir you can carry on Thank okay, thank you. you very much. Okay, good morning all, and thank you very much well, for your attendance well, for this uh, morning session. So let me um, share the slide first. Make sure you got it. So okay. have you re? You can see the slide now. Yes, it is. Okay, visible. yes. Then what I do is I'm going to take away my camera so we can uh, focus well, on the slide. So once again, thank you very much well, for the invitation. It's truly my honor and pleasure well, being here well, with you well, this morning. And well, on one hand, we were discussing about the situation about the COVID nineteen uh, virus and uh, how it affects uh, everybody's life and the lockdown, etc. But one thing I find out is really amazing that well, through these well few months, well, with the opportunities and the technology, I'm able to deliver a lot of webinars well across the continent, well in India. And as a matter of fact, well, this session since the beginning of May, this is my forty first well session. And I still have a quite a couple to go, and um, well, I, I'm going to share on this particular topic called Archibald E Resources and Initiatives in Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning. Well, I congratulate well the organizers well for this one week uh, event. That I, I can see that you have well a whole well, list of eminent researchers are talking on different topics from different parts of the world. Well, range uh, apart from your local well um, across India, quite a number of the IIT institution. Well, you have speakers from from uh, Vietnam or from USA, from Turkey, from Iraq, and um, also you've been talking on different application aspect as well. And I can see that well, the uh, speaker coming after me is going to talk about the well, machine learning um, approach to the control of the autonomous well, underwater vehicle. And earlier this year, we have another one talking about deep learning and the well, CNN in the healthcare, and also all the others were well, speakers earlier on well, this month, uh, this week as well. But well. So a little bit different well, from all of them. Well, all of them are the eminent researchers or well, expert in their in their field of study. Well, I look at my road today. It's really more like a pointer. Well, I would like to uh, point to some of the resources. Well, which I believe you may find well helpful. Well, in your study and your research or in your work. Well, in the area of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, in particular related with those uh, these resources are from the IEEE. Well, I'm seeing myself wearing two hats right now. Uh, one is, well, as a pointer, well, to the resources. Is another one is I would like to well introduce to you IEEE, and I, I, I'm pretty sure quite a number of you uh, must be IEEE member. Uh, also, you are aware of IEEE. 
But uh, nevertheless, uh, I believe uh, a lot of you may be like me at the beginning uh, t uh, time when I just first joined IEEE and I wasn't really involved too much with the volunteering. Then honestly, I don't know much about IEEE. So I always hear people say, that, okay, what can I get from IEEE? What are the benefits of becoming a man? I'm, I'm doing the road that will try to show you uh, how IEEE works so that you can have a better organizational structure, the opportunities. And also in particular, I point to some of those initiative resources, well, which I hope you, you may find them useful. So I take this opportunity. First of all, I acknowledge and thank you for the invitation uh, from Professor Dash, uh, Professor of Computer Science at the University of North Orasa University in Paripada. I admit that well, there are so many states well in in uh, India that I'm not familiar well, uh, with all of them. Although I've been to a few, uh, I have been to uh, Chennai, I have been to uh, Mumbai, I have been to Kolkata, I've been to uh, uh, Kochi, I have been to um, Vizag Bay. I've been to uh, Pune, I've been to uh, Gujarat, so quite a number of places. Uh, I'm quite happy and very proud of the opportunity, but still there's so much to see. I mean, well, India has such a long well, history of culture, of, um, of, uh, of kingdoms and, and all your, well, I heard about the scenery you mentioned, well, near well, your university and state, well, really, I, my, my heart really jumped with the excitement that if the next opportunity come along, then I really look forward well, to visit well, your place. I need to make a, a quick disclaimer that uh, whatever well, I'm, I'm sharing today is really entirely my own opinion and, and experience. And um, but they're not the opinions of IEEE. So even though that I'm a volunteer for IEEE for many years, but well, this is, I'm just speaking of it as, as a member and uh, as a volunteer. And I just uh, want to uh, point and share to the goodies and all the resources we have uh, within the organization. So I'm targeting the audience. Well, maybe you have some undergraduate students, postgraduate students, uh, we have some faculty members and researchers, well, IEEE members and also non IEEE well, members as well. So I hope that this is going to be useful. So the agenda today is, well, I have a quick introduction to myself because I find that it is extremely important because nowadays, well, you have so many opportunities meeting new people, well, on the website. And then, well, and also people make a lot of claims and, and a, a lot of people making a lot of promises. I think it's always important for us trying to find out well, further information about or someone well, you, you encounter. So I'm, I'm going to share with you some of my backgrounds, uh, although you heard uh, briefly, well, in the introduction by Professor Dash earlier on. And then I'll have a quick introduction to IEEE as an organizational well, structure. So really, you have a good understanding. I hope you, you have an appreciation of how we operate. And then I, I point to some of the societies uh, which have direct relevance well, to the um, topic we're talking about on artificial intelligence and also machine learning. Well, these are referring to the computational intelligence, the robotic and automations, and also system management and fanatic. Well, you note that I didn't mention there's another well important one, computers well, society. Well, because well, I, I look at these three societies, uh, they're much more specific uh, in dealing with some of the um, e techniques and applications, well, whereas computer science is much more broader. Then I look into the, the educational resources which are available well, to both the members and the non-members. Some of them are, uh, are free and some of them, are, you may have to pay some fees for that. But I can assure you, well, the fees they charge in IEEE is not really for profit because IEEE Charter is a non-profit organization. So unlike other organizations that offer the resources and courses, they are making money, but not in our case. Or well, maybe they are vendor, but they have their own products that they want to push. And then I'll talk about some initiatives on the emerging technology. Well, this part is due to my well, involvement in the past in one of the well, uh, a committee, we're called New Initiatives Committee. And then uh, we have uh, funding and support, well, uh, and you budget around $3 million to, to support a lot of, of, of uh, initiatives. So I'm going to point out some of those initiatives directly well, related to the emerging technologies and in particular to the AI and the machine learning we are going to talk about today. Then I'm going to finish off by introducing well, another well, resource, again, not too many people talk about, it's called, talk about, it's called the um, the technology uh, roadmaps. So I would like to point to you, again, well, uh, some of the roadmaps that you may have to be a member before you can get it for a, for a subscription. But on the other hand, well, there are others well, I consider is very well, crucial because uh, they're not only uh, telling us the state of the art we have today, but also give us uh, some kind of a prediction Well, what happened, well, how they see well, within a 15 years horizon. So I'm going to Hope that well for the next uh, over an hour or so, I'm going to make good use of this time. So where am I now? So I did uh, do a Google search <coughs> about your university and your location. So I, I do know that you are on the North 
east of uh, of, of uh, India. And as I said, the closest one I've been to your know, area will be well when I visit uh, Kolkata. But my, I myself now currently reside in the in Western Australia, Perth. As you can see, Australia is a big continent. In WA, we have around one third well, of the overall area, and we have a population around well, uh, 2.4 million well, if, within a state, within a metropolitan area, we got around 2 million. So we only have around 10% of the overall population. So compared to the um, East Coast, where people are more familiar with uh, big cities like Sydney, Melbourne, and uh, Brisbane, well, we are comparatively smaller, but in a way that uh, it become a part of our advantage because of our isolation. So that's why our the effects on the um, virus is not that high on us. So Murdoch University, I have been, well, with Murdoch University, well, since 2003, although officially I retired it in 2015, but I still um, have the emer emeritus appointment, which is an honorary well, appointment well, for life. And, um, well, Murdoch University is the second oldest university in the state of WA. We were established in 1974, and so close to around 50 years now. The oldest one is the University of Western Australia. We have uh, over 100 years of history. And uh, the other two universities, uh, Curtin University, where I have worked for 14 years, and Didi Carvin University. We do have one private university, the uh, Notre Dame University. Well, Australia is quite different compared to India, that we only have a very limited number of private universities. And Notre Dame is one of it, affiliated to Notre Dame University in USA. The other one is Bond University well, on the East Coast. In Queensland, but well, Murdoch University is located well on the uh, on the south side of the um, in the city or south of the river. Uh, this is the Swan River. Uh, it's a very picturesque um, place. So if you get opportunity to visit, well, um, well, do give me a call and I hope that I can be your local tourist guide to show you around our city. So as far as my professional uh, background, and you can take a look well at our university's website. Uh, we do have a um, profile page for each of the staff. You just simply search Murdoch University Profile Lands Fund and you'll come across on this page. And then from there, well, you see under different headings. Uh, if you do a scroll down, then you can see, well, click on it. There's some um, discussion. Uh, just share with you some of um, what I've been doing uh, in the past. So if you take a look at, about me, then you'll see a description. And I just put it in all point forms. Well, I always like to share well some of these photos. Well, these are some of the photos close to um. Well, this is 1974. It's um my first first job on the Merchant Navy in the radio station. Uh, I was a radio and electronic officer, and this is my second ship. Well, this is 1976 after I completed one year in the UK training, and um. But what I'm always amazed and talk about the communication how it advanced so much. There about the one behind me in here. Well, it's a transmitter, uh, which have a power of one kilowatt and using vacuum valves. Well, thereby a lot of people have not even have seen it before. And then we have a, a receiver. But what I, I always like to compare it within a period of two years, well, from my first ship to my second ship. Well, the satellite technology has already beginning to come in. Well, they have the satellite emergency system put in place already. And well, this is another photo that uh, when I did my master's degree in 1981. And that was a time that I worked on a project on a microprocessor, well, that was an 8-bit microprocessor from Motorola. And this is a, this is a, um, a Hewlett Packard. But well, what you see on, is, is not a terminal. Actually, it's a Hewlett Packard, well, what we call a microprocessor development system. So this one hook up to the microprocessor, do all the simulation and emulation, etc. So now looking back from 1982 until now, well, the advancement of microprocessor is so, is so much. And then well, I started off in my PhD study in 1988, well, in University of Western Australia. And that was a time I started work on the artificial intelligence system. And then my thesis is really uh, a rule-based system, a knowledge-based system. And then, well, the one part of it is talking about the optimization techniques, uh, looking at one of the problems, which I'll, I'll share with you with, with that paper shortly. So you can see uh, briefly, my, well, my CV and well, what I've done in the past, well, now close to well, 50 years, I started off in my study in the 1972, and then I, I did my undergrad, master's. I taught, well, majority of my time in my career has been spent in academic. I taught in Singapore Polytechnic, and then I taught in Curtin University, and then I taught in uh, Murdoch University. Well, even though I retired in 2015, but officially I, I'm still doing a, a bit of supervision well, for a postgraduate student. 
I have also held quite a number of um, administration roles apart from my teaching and um, uh, teaching and, and research. But I, I'm more well excited and happy well with my involvement with IEEE for the past over well, 25 years, over a quarter of a, of a century. And currently, I'm the Region 10 Educational Activities Committee well, chair, and I'm also involved well two main roles. Well, one is in the Conference Quality Committee. Uh, whereby well we oversee and ensure the quality of the papers well from the conference proceeding you know actually we explore and i also involved uh, in the new initiatives committee well for a good few years and i was a chair as well and then, uh, this is the one that support well, quite a fair amount of money well to the initiatives uh, which again uh, i'll share with you uh, later on on the society i have been with the board of um, directors what should we system manage a bit? Uh, the Board of uh, Governors, uh, ICBE System Management of Fanatics for six years, and within the local sections and Australian Council, I have been all involved with that. So it has been my, my passion, well, for, for the, these few months, I've been sharing about the ICBE, sharing about, well, uh, some of the areas, talking about research grants, because uh, in my role well, as a research director, I've been sharing about the initiatives from ICBE, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now let's take a look at some of the things where you can also find out from my from uh, my university website, because I hope that that may be useful for you if you're looking for some papers, uh, if some of the areas you think it might be relevant to your interest. So if you go back to my uh, profile page, well, you will see there's one link, well, link to the list of publication. And you click on that one that will go to the university research repository. So it listed 334 papers in there, or articles. But in reality, I have more than that because some of the early papers, well, they were not included in the electronic format. So you can well take a look well at, at the individual author. You can even click onto the authors, then you can see some other uh, papers from the person as well. So in there, they collected uh, a number of 334. It could be uh, journals, um, conference papers, and even book chapters, etc. Uh, what I'm really amazed at, well, in terms of the data, well, they have been collecting well from the website. And I just checked the other day. Well, I, I found out that well, really quite amazed at uh, from the statistic. It tells me that I have 334 items in there, and there was 61% of these items are full text. So that means that they're open access, where you can download the full paper. But on top of that, well, I was really amazed to find out there are 61,507 downloads well, from all these items. And then, well, the highest one is it downloaded 5,162 times. So this is quite interesting that you can see that how information are now readily available, well, just across well, the, the, the group, you can, well, just take it, well, compared to the past, well, if I have to get a paper, I have to either get a, um, a subscription, and before that, I need to go to the library, I take a look at it, I need to take a look at the uh, printed copies, and then make a photocopy, and etc. So how time have changed. And also another piece of in, important information, which I hope be it may be useful to you, is you can also take a look at the thesis that I have uh, supervised it to completion. Again, I have 31 of those have been uh, collected in the university repository. Again, all of these are uh, readily available. You will be able to see that I have covered quite a, a broad uh, spectrum of uh, topics because mainly I, I'm more interested in, in, the, in the area of interest for the student and I hope that they will be useful to them. You will see I have a good number of the students are from Thailand and also, well, from Indonesia, from uh, Malaysia, from um, Hong Kong, from uh, China, and also uh, from some of the Middle East as well, including uh, Libya, Iraq, uh, etc. So even for each of these theses, as I said, well, if you click on that, well, you'll be able to find out, well, you can take a look at the front pages, you can read the abstract, and you can download the whole thesis. And well, even take a look at this example. Well, this is a student, uh, Dangera. She, she graduated in 2008. Well, that's what, uh, the year that she, she granted um, the degree. And then this particular uh, thesis on knowledge management platform promoting sustainable energy in rural Thai communities. And it's quite interesting. Again, well, there was some uh, data on that. And I, I was quite amazed to find out this thesis, well, it has been downloaded 1,880 times. And then, well, and there were some years, well, you have over 100 downloads on that particular thesis. And then well, you quiet down a little bit and suddenly, well, this year you have another upsurge of a, a few, I don't know, maybe under 30 or 40 so downloads as well. So it's really quite amazing. Again, compared to the time when I first started my PhD, if I want to take a look at uh, some other people's thesis, I have to go to the library, if it's from our university. 
Then I, I, I need to request for food, the librarian, well, he or she will take it out from the shelf. I may even need to put on a gloves before I can touch it because uh, they consider uh, there only one copy. And then well, later on, well, I'm able to purchase some of the reprints of the thesis from overseas. But now you can see this, well, you're sitting at home, you can just click it, you can download everything, well, on your computer. So how times have changed? Well, apart from the information you can get, well, from our university, because I do see this is part of the resources that you can get access to. Uh, you can also get my information from the public domain, well, on the internet, like the Google Scholar. So on the Google Scholar, they have cited, I have um, of 3,651 citations from my papers. And then well, in here, they consider my citation well, index, uh, H index is 28. So that means that, well, 28 of those papers has been cited 28 times, well, minimum. So this is how they work out the, the um, H index. And then, well, this particular paper on simulated engineering based economic dispatch well, algorithm, well, this was part of my um, PhD work uh, with my late supervisor, published in 1980, uh, 1993. And you can see this one got four, close to 500 well, being cited. And what I find amazing is, well, even up to now, well, 27 years uh, after um, the, the submission of, of this thesis, well, it is still being cited. So that's, I'm really, I found quite amazed. So I have some other, well, um, resources you can take a look like the Archive Explore and Research Gate. Well, in here, it rang me as um, uh, the 12 percent or so. Well, you can see that I did not really actively, well, contribute too much well in this particular site. So that's why I don't see much on here. In here, the Comia, well, 28, 21 for my H index. They also recognize my highest cited research work is on the same paper you see earlier on. Well, you said explore already. This is one from Scoopus. Uh, I know that Scoopus is now well the one a lot of uh, university also looking at it as some kind of a de facto type of uh, comparison. Well, this this one that they say that uh, they have two hundred papers well in within this one, and they consider my H index in here is sixteen. So. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave this, uh, this um, in here. So I think I have given you sufficient information about myself. Well, you can take a look at some of my past work. You can download the thesis. You can download the papers. You can also well, compare my performance well, uh, through the uh, Google Scholar and uh, Scoopers, etc. Now, go to the second part of my talk, introducing IEEE. As I have said, well, I... I'm not seeing myself as a salesman. I don't want to, well, to be treated as just simply I want to promote, well, just for the sake of, of selling you a product. I'm not, I'm not doing that at all. But I look at it this way, that I have been a member, well, now close to around, uh, close to 30 years. Um, and then well, I have been volunteer for over 25, 26 years. I consider that, well, I have been a benefit. I have benefited a lot from IEEE. And I just simply want to share, well, what do we have? And uh, I hope it will help you as well. So this is my main objective, okay? So if you are not an IEEE member, I hope you are not offended by, by this seem to me, seems to you that I might be hard pushing the IEEE. But if you are a member of IEEE, I'm hoping that, well, you may get to know a little bit more about our organization. So our IEEE is the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. So this is a tagline called Advancing Technology for Humanity. It has been used around 10 years now. Before that, well, our tagline was um, networking the world. So in a way, I have seen that IEEE have uh, fulfilled our mission that in the earlier part that uh, you can see all the development, well, all the telecommunication um, and all the internet technology, they come to this point that really compared to uh, close to 50 years ago when I was a radio officer and I was the only one on the ship. Uh, I can uh, get the information uh, from the rest of the world because I food through the Morse code. I can get a weather report. I can set a... Um, a, telex, a, a telegram message, I can receive a telegram message. But nowadays, well, if someone got a satellite phone, well, you can get access to uh, almost uh, any part of the world. And I think, well, in time to come, when Elon Musk well, completed the, um, the, um, the, the Skylink project, well, the, the objective is to launch thousands of satellites. Well, you cover every part of the world. And then, well, you, you will be much more, well, fantastic in terms of our connectivity. So, but we see that, well, humility is really much more important because uh, all of us are facing the challenge, well, in, in today's world. Well, right now we are in the midst of the challenge of the COVID-19 virus, but also well, before that, well, everyone been talking about, well, the uh, climate change. Well, we've seen the, the extreme weather, so extreme temperatures, and, and, and really it's quite worrying. 
But on the other hand, we also see that the technology definitely will have a part to play. And, and, and the artificial intelligence and the machine learning and actually are part of the engine behind it. So this is the one I'm going to talk about uh, shortly. So I would say that looking at the organization, it is important to see the organization, well, what does it intend to do? Or what is, uh, what is the mission and mission of it? So of course, uh, you've seen that our mission is advancing technology for the, the benefit of humanity. But um, we also have our, our short-term and long-term plan. So we have a plan of, for the next five years. We call strategic plan 2020 to 2025. You can download all the information from the internet. They're all readily available. It's, it's, actually, it's not a secret society. It's, everyone can assess. It's a very uh, democratic process. But what I would like to draw your attention in this um, strategic plan is some of the, some of the um, focus and, uh, and the target I, I believe is relevant to you. I'm not going to read out all of them, but I highlight that just at least two of them. One is where we see ourselves to be a trusted source of educational services and resources to support lifelong learning. So you see that learning is not limited to just within a school, not within a university. We see that even all the way go, well, un until then, even when you retire, well, you still have the opportunity to learn. I myself have admitted, well, through these two months, uh, I'm getting more familiar with using with this uh, online conferencing platform like Zoom, like uh, Google Meet, well, like WebEx, uh, um, uh, like uh, Microsoft Team, and also some of the, um, the uh, WebEx is from uh, Cisco and some other uh, proprietary system as well. And often more than that, I even get, well, going to the video production, well, using some of these um, uh, uh, applications, uh, freeware. So it's, it's really important that uh, all of us are keep on learning. So even though that we are facing whatever uncertainty well, in life, that we're able to prepare ourselves well, for the next thing to come. And also, also another thing I would like to highlight is actually we see ourselves providing opportunities for career and professional development. And this is particularly well, important well, for the students and for the young professionals that you have to see yourself not just simply as you are right now. Do not be bogged down well, with the limitation and the, um, and the challenge you're facing. Rather, you have to keep on well, upscaling yourself, well, retooling yourself. So you've got to prepare well, for, for the days to come because I can assure you, well, technology is changing. And you can see well, from my start in 1972, starting to become a radio officer, learning radio. And then well, if you read well, all my papers and, and the thesis, you can see I cover and change well, so much over the years as well. Well, we have to because technology is changing. And also maybe well, we see that the focus is changing as well. So I'm going to talk about these two parts. Okay, although we do see a, a lot of other things uh, RGB uh, does is in terms of the enhancing public understanding, building communities, but really it will take me more time to talk about that. So I'll just concentrate on these two parts, uh, talking about uh, professional development and also the educational resources. So first of all, how does RGB operate? The first thing is I, I always say that IEEE is a member organization. In other words, we're made up of members. Well, members decide well, where we want to do, or what we want to do, where do we want to go, and members elect and vote, okay? The leaders are only there for the short term. Well, IEEE have a limitation well, on our terms well, well, for the, our president, it's only one year. And then well, for regional directors, two years. And well, even for the local uh, particular operational unit, well, at maximum six years. So really, we, we do not see, well, it should be just limited to one or two person, but rather it should be open up well, for every members. So the operation is that we have a geographical um, uh, distribution where we consider where you live and then where you are uh, located according to the section or subsection. And then uh, within that, uh, you could be a, a council within a certain country. And then uh, you have the, the technical interest according to the societies. And the society uh, would have the chapters well, within the section as well. Well, we also take care of the students. So we encourage them to have a student branch. In the student branch, we can also cater for their technical interest. They have a technical society student branch chapter. And we also have what we call affinity groups. Well, those are the, well, we do see that, well, there are uh, certain categories. Well, we, we cater for the special uh, commonalities. Well, say, for example, like the women in engineering, the young professionals are those they have graduated and uh, from this uh, study and then they're 15 years. We consider in the early career and also the young professional. Even people like me, well, I would consider myself, I even passed the time of the mid-career and also uh, the, the late career. I have retired already. But then again, well, I, I, I still see myself uh, still going on to the phase of my 
of my membership and going to live members well when I uh, eligible for that. So all in all, uh, you can see that IEEE is really quite comprehensive uh, taking care of the members. So the overall organizational governance is based on this. So we have all the members in here. We have close around 400,000 members worldwide. Well, within the uh, Asia Pacific region, where we have around 100, around well, uh, 33 percent or so of the overall membership. So it's organized according to the major boards. So we got six major boards. So where you locate according to the sections, uh, this is the belong to the region and under the members and geographic activities board. If you're interested in a certain society, you have already heard me talk about some of those societies, um, uh, such as the uh, computer, computational intelligence, um, such as the um, system management cybernetics. But all those are divided into divisions. So we have 10 divisions and 10 regions. So then each one of these, they have a chapters, okay, according to the interests of the society and under the section. And now one of our major well, products from IEEE and our set are publications. And also we host conferences as well. So that one is under the Public Services and Products Board. So this is in particular of interest well, to the academics and also for the industry as well. And then they have the Educational Activities Board. Again, I'm going to expand on this part. In particular, those resources I'm referring is under, well, provided well, from this board. We have a standard association. Now, this is a very important uh, role well, in establishing the standards well, for the industry. A lot of implementation of the ideas and the research. And then uh, the IEEE use SA board because of this one oversee the six region well, from the country of USA. USA still have the highest number of members uh, of the whole IEEE, but um, it's still under 50% now, although the, the, the number is gradually uh, dropping. Uh, understandable because of the age. Uh, on the other hand, well, Region 10 is the one growing and, and is still growing. Uh, you will see the geographic location in this in this chart. So as I have mentioned, Region 1 to 6, they're all in USA. So this is, of course, because of the uh, historic reason. This is where IEEE started over 100 years ago. Region 7 is the closest neighbor to them is the Canada. And then Region 8, well, uh, the um, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and also uh, Russia. Even including uh, Greenland, it's interesting. So it's, it's a big area they cover, and also a large number of countries. But membership-wise, they're not as high as the Region 10. Region 10 is the Asia-Pacific region, as you can see, it cover of South Asia, Southeast Asia, North Asia, Oceanics, well, countries, including Australia, where I reside, and also New Zealand, and also some of the South Pacific Island as well. As you can see, the number in here, based on end of last year, 2019, well, we have 1, 000, uh, 135,000 members that comprises of 32% um, of the overall membership. And then you can see the other one is the Region 9, which is the South America and also the Latin America. So we do expect to see the uh, ongoing growth uh, in Region uh, 8, 9, and 10. You can imagine that because, well, you still have a huge potential in Africa, and then also, well, even in, in Asia, we, we do see that uh, still ongoing, in particular in, in India and some other neighboring country as well. So with the Asia Pacific region, it's subdivided well, according to the section. We got 30, well, 59 well, sections and I think 37 also subsections. And then, well, subsections are those well, local units that haven't got enough number to make up a section. With India, you have 12 sections. Okay, you made up, well, the India Council. The latest addition is the VSEC Bay section. Well, it was uh, established late last year. And then, well, you have the China Council, and you can see a number of the sections well, within China. Similarly, for Korea, for Japan, Australia. So most of these are, are located along, accord, well, uh, according to the states. Okay, Only in Queensland, they have two, two sections, one in Queensland section and another one in North Queen Australia section. But that one also including some of the uh, Asia, um, some of the Pacific Islands. And then they got a New Zealand. Well, even though it's a small country, but they also have a council made up of three parts, the north, south, and the central part. And then I mentioned about the subsection. Well, you can see even subsection including Afghanistan and uh, Mongolia and uh, Nepal, well, Bhutan, uh, Myanmar, uh, Laos, uh, Cambodia, okay, uh, Brunei. And then you have all the sections according to the country. Some of them are quite big as well, okay, like Hong Kong, a couple of thousands, uh, Thai, uh, Taiwan, that they have a couple of sections in there, Tainan, and etc., um, etc. Et 
So as you can see, IEEE is well organized according to the geographic location. And then well, the overall well, operation according to the committees, apart from the board you have seen, so I'm not going to bore you with all the different well, committees in here. But what I want to show you in here is there are a lot of opportunities to volunteer, well, to help out, well, to, to, to lead well within the organization. So when you join IEEE, it's not only as a member, but you also have the opportunities to be trained well to serve uh, as volunteer and also uh, to get involved in the leadership uh, rank and file as well. I'm going to highlight some of these um, uh, uh, committees and also their location. So I was just using the earlier slide and then I do a screen capture part of it well, under the MGA and also under some of the boards uh, in here. So the MJ is the one referring to the well, membership and geographical uh, um, geographic activities board. And you can see what well, they have dedicated while well, taking care of the women, uh, uh, young professionals, live members, student activities, and women in engineering. You can see a similar structure is also reflected within the regional uh, committee as well. And then well, under the regions, so this is where we located as the section, the subsection you have heard it. And then you've got the chapters according to the technical society, your student branches, student branch chapters, and also student branch affinity group as well. So what I'm, I'm really excited well, to see is a lot of um, energy well, from the OU and also from the affinity group within India that a lot of activities are, are being held over the past few months. Then I would like to draw the attention to some of these societies, as you can see, all, all together 39 societies. The one I'm going to highlight is a computational intelligence uh, society, a robotic and automation societies, and also system management fanatic. Well, why I highlight those? Because I see that they have a, a strong alliance to the topic well, we're talking today on artificial intelligence and machine learning. So these three societies, they're also located within the same division. If you heard me earlier on, you, you heard me saying that there are 10 divisions, division one to division X, and X actually is a Roman letters for 10. So these are the three societies within this division, computational intelligence, robotics and automation, system management and fanatics. We also have some others, the control system for engineering in medical medicine and bio, biology and uh, photonics. Okay, so all these belong, society belong to the same division and then one division directors as well. So you see, also see the number. We get a monthly data in terms of our membership. So you can see that we have a high grade members. That is the, the members and above senior members and fellow. We got a student members. We got a student uh, society affiliates. But well, those are the ones that only joined the society, but they didn't join actually as a full member. And then the total numbers with the affiliate and also without the affiliates. So now let's very quickly go through some of this society. Now, as I said, well, just because of the time, we have only an hour or so, so I'm not going through in detail all this, but I just want to show to you, well, the, the websites, well, some of the key points. That I would leave it to you to explore further, well, if they are of interest to you. So the Computational Intelligence Society, well, really, this, they're interested in the, in the nature, inspired problem solving, uh, including neural networks, evolutionary algorithm, a fuzzy system, hybrid intelligence system, etc. So they have well, involved with the development of the big data and Internet of Things. Now, those terms, again, you will see me share with you later on as an individual initiative for each one of, of those. And then the members include a set of periodicals, well, conference discounts and more. So if you go to the website, cis.rtv.org, and this is what you see, and you can see the download menu, and then when you can pull it down, you can see uh, all the um, uh, subtitles and what they talk about as well. You have the uh, access to the newsletter, magazines, uh, video libraries, uh, webinars, podcasts, um, publications, uh, some an announcement, etc. And also the next one is the Robotics and Automation Society. So this is one that fostered the development and facilitate the exchange of scientific and technological knowledge in robotics and automation that benefits the profession and humanity. And then, well, the membership will include your access to cutting edge periodicals, uh, the resources center and discount on the conference and events and a networking opportunity. Now, of course, uh, another advantage of being well, the member of RGBE is well, you will get discount on the conference. And and again, as I said, a lot of time people said, oh, what do I get? Well, why should I spend well the, the money being a member? And I always say that well, by just simply going to one single conference, well, a lot of time the discount that you have earned has already make up your membership fee. 
And then also we have some other mechanism to encourage the membership is uh, what we call the, um, the get a member. So if, if a new member come in and they specify that it's being introduced by you, then you will have some credit for towards your, your membership. So again, well, it's quite easily that they cover more than, of course, well, the money is not in hand, but you can use it for credit. You can use it for, for your membership fee. You can use it for, to, to purchase product from IEEE. So again, if you take a look at the website, well, www.ieee-ras.org, and this is what you see. You talk about the membership, talk about the conferences, talk about the periodicals, the publications, etc., etc. Then the next one is the SMC. And this is the one uh, I consider well, my home society in the sense that I have been uh, uh, the longest membership of this one. And as I said, well, I've also been involved with the Board of Governors for six years, and that's the maximum I can reach. And uh, cu even currently, I'm still part of the um, uh, organizing committee helping out with the um, uh, chapters well, within the region. So again, you see something similar, all the resources and what are we all about. And in SMC, actually, subdivide talking about two, three parts. Well, the systems, well, man and cybernetics. And uh, also they have uh, other journal and transactions well, of interest. And also they have a lot of technical submittees. Well, according to your personal interest, you can take a look at. Okay, so that finish off with the part about the society. Then one of the other resources, well, we can talk about. And I, I would, well, first of all, well, go back to the fundamentals and talk about well, how IEEE rose well, within the AI and the machine learning and et cetera. So I, I pick up some of the slides well, from IEEE Explores and also take a look at what we call the innovation spotlight. So in there, well, you can see the number. Well, if you go to the website, you can just pull it down. You can see all the different articles and write up and other different aspects, 3D printing, mobile robots, 3D concrete well, printers, well, well, cyber, uh, computer security or cyber security, machine learning, and how to advance the, um, using film to advance the, the eye blink detection technology, edge intelligence, uh, mobile diagnosis devices, well, detecting the device theft in real time through the walking pattern analysis. So you can see, you can always get access well, to the latest article and talk about the latest technology. And a lot of this you will see is under the topic of AI and machine learning. And you can also see that from some of the slides or within the same website, they have a video talking about, well, the fourth industrial revolution. So what does it, what does it mean by that? You just simply want to highlight how RGB wrote in it, in it, well, with reference to the number of publications, well, with respect to all these different topics that are fueling the development of the, what we call the uh, 4IR, for Industrial Revolution. So, even though they're not necessarily all of them are talking entirely just on uh, AI and machine learning, but really, if you take a look further, you really have to admit they have one part to play, uh, a major part to play one, one way or another. If you take a look on big data, anyone playing with, with machine learning, you cannot get away from big data because we need the data to do the training, to do the analysis. 110 documents and plus are in that area. Take a look, Internet of Things, another one quite similar to that one. Autonomous robots, so obviously this one, now the, top, the hottest topic, everyone interested in autonomous vehicles. And some others, well, like the autonomous vehicle, as I have said, and also cybersecurity. So you, you, I believe that you will agree with me that IEEE really have a major part to play, well, through our members, uh, uh, contributing the knowledge, well, through our repository and explore, and uh, all this under the latest topic, uh, the fueling the fourth revolution, uh, in industrial revolution. And also take a look in terms of the patents. The patent is important because this is where they're being put into good use and the industries, uh, the business are making good use of it while, while having products are being developed. According to here, is the IEEE is made up around 34%. Although there's another 40%, but that is all others add up together. So that means that if you take a look at any individual source, then we can see that IEEE well, is providing well highest even some people will say, oh, I just received one query. Oh, uh, should I publish in Sprangler? I'll say, yes, why not? But if you take a look at this one, only 4% of the patents are make reference to papers from Sprangler, whereas 34% are from IEEE. 
So I can assure you that you are in in good place. Well, you are in good company. Oh, this is the data from the last 20 years. Then in terms of the AI investment since 2006, so according to here, you say that Google has spent 3.9 billion. Well, and 33% of, well, of the patents are referenced to IEEE. And you'll be surprised. Well, we run a conference um, in Perth, I think 2016, that uh, we have, uh, the conference is one of the um, prominent conferences in, uh, in the web technology, called a World Wide Web Conference. And well, you'll be surprised, we have a lot of uh, submission actually uh, from Google, from Facebook, from Microsoft uh, research, but they do put in a lot of efforts, well, for the research, uh, being hired as a full-time researcher. For Amazon, $871 million. Apple, Intel, Microsoft, okay? So you, you, if you take a look at their website, you can also see some articles They're talking about the RGB research in AI, talk about uh, neural network, uh, flooding, uh, flood forecasting, uh, space communication, and uh, driving behavior detection, etc. So what I, what I can say that well, we can establish that IEEE have a major part to play in terms of the AI research and AI discipline. Not only just simply well, uh, working in the academics, but rather, well, even the, the patents, the industry are referring well, to our knowledge within our repository. Now, let's come to the next part, resources. So now we have so much uh, know-how, apart from the papers well, in the Explore, in the conference paper, in the journal's paper, well, are, are those being packed in such a way that uh, they can use it as some kind of a teaching well, for the self-development of continued education? The answer is yes. Well, we do have that because actually we have the Educational Activities Board. Uh, that has a major part to play in, in providing the resources and also not only just well, to the board itself, but across the whole IEEE spectrum. So this is where the IEEE Educational Activities Board strategies come in. And you can also see the alignment well, within the IEEE 2020 to 2025 strategies, you really take a look at the core purpose to develop and deliver educational products and services to our members, professionals, educators, and students that excite and inspire understanding of IEEE field of interest. And it is support professional enhancement, foster diversity, enhance access to lifelong learning opportunities. So you can see that the, how you support uh, alignment but together with the IEEE uh, 2020 to 2025 strategic plans. So again, you see the the, uh, the structure of the six uh, major boards, and then the year you see yourself, they're providing the coordination and cooperation. In other words, well, the materials are not just from EA itself, but rather the materials are from different OUs, or organizational units across the whole IEEE. So that's why you see the setup of the chart in such a way, trying to encompass the whole thing. Again, you have already heard me earlier on, well, actually, you see education is not only just limited to a certain phase of your life, but rather it's across the whole lifelong learning. So from a time of pre-university, well, actually we have programs, well, cater uh, for the K to 12. And then, well, well you, you might may not have heard about that. It's called Try Engineering. That we try to uh, inspire, well, bring the awareness of the STEM education uh, among the school children. STEM stands for um, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. And then we got a university level. This is where a lot of students started their membership with IEEE as student members or graduate student members. Then well, when they graduate, they go into the industry, they become young professionals. And then well, as time goes by, well, they, they begin to success in their, in their own right, in their own career. Then we consider them as the mid-career or advanced uh, career or professionals. And then when you come to people like me, then I have retired, but I'm still actively involved. And I would say that, well, 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 for the for the past years, uh, since my retirement, well, actually, I put more time in IEEE than my full-time job. So, let's come to the products. So, the first product I would like to mention is the ILN. It stands for IEEE Learning Network. So, this is one of the initiatives supported by the new initiative uh, program. Uh, the main objective is, is to provide a one single entry point as a, as a portal. Uh, so that this platform can provide you uh, the resources for continue, uh, continuing education across the whole IEEE. So it's also a shared learning management system, and also you aim to provide the, the learning experience well, for the users. So if you go to the website, so this is what you expect to see as a front page. And then well, you can see that 
well, the partners, well, the one who support and provide all these materials are from the different organization units within IEEE, including the society, as you can see in here. Computer technology, the computer society, communication society, power and energy society. So these are the biggest uh, society within IEEE. And some of the smaller ones, well, like the um, power electronics, uh, industrial applications, um, and then, well, we have the affinity group, which you, are, you have heard I have said, the women in engineering, and also from the major boards, well, IEEE USA, and some of the initiatives, well, like the, um, the smart city, smart grid, and all those things. So, in the website, well, if you scroll it down, well, you'll see under different categories, okay, different topics that you might be interested in, and I'm going to show you some examples. But before that, well, these are the latest uh, addition, well, to the the, the collections of all these modules. As you can see, uh, the terms are really the emerging technologies uh, on the, are being treated as a, what they call the hot topics right now. Well, Internet of Things, definitely. Well, you have seen earlier on, they're talking about over hundred uh, thousands of papers uh, under this, uh, this, this topic. Cybersecurity, 5G, uh, blockchain. And they're also talking about on autonomous uh, vehicles, uh, smart grid, yeah, artificial intelligence and talking about the ethics in design. Well, this is another topic uh, I would say is very important. Again, I don't have much time to talk about today, but we are trying to launch some other thing to, to weigh the awareness well, of the ethics well in the autonomous system. And edge computing, well, enterprise or blockchain. So all this you can see are very relevant well, to the topics well, we, we are talking about today, AI and machine learning. So if you go back to the well, to the ILN uh, website, uh, by choosing the appropriate topics, then you click onto that, then you will pull down. So in this case, I have chosen the emerging technologies under the artificial intelligence. So you show me a number of those modules available well, in here. Okay, so you can click on this one. As I said, some of these, well, you need to pay charges for that. Um, although I'm in the process of trying to work out with um, IEEE's, is, is there any a mechanism whereby reduce well, the load uh, of the user. And then some others, in this case, machine learning. Uh, in here, it tells me I, well, I, they get nine modules, and then the machine learning in power system. Uh, uh, machine learning in power system part two. Okay, machine learning, well, for the ultra low power device video, etc., etc. So you can take your time while well, you can examine well, all the available resources uh, at, at your pleasure. We got deep learning as well, okay, something similar. So you have, in this case, well, you have three topics, deep learning, application to power system and analysis, adaptive uh, hybrid deep learning for power system state estimation, well, a guide to autonomous well, vehicle technology, virtual events. And then computational intelligence. Again, these are some of the ones where you can see implementation of CI, CI natural in, well, information processing, collaborative, well, computational intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's finish off with a brief introduction to the ILN. Now let's move on to other resources. IEEE e-learning library. This is the one under spectrum, sorry, under explore. So if you go to the explore, you can just visit. To assess the e-learning library, just visit the explore digital library. And if you go to explore, this is what you see, and you will see that these are the courses available. Just look into the IEEE courses. So you can click on the all courses or maybe some of the new introduction, 5G, and then supplies blockchain, and finite elements, autonomous vehicle technologies. You will see some of these actually appear also in ILN. Because we are in the transition period, and we try to well, transit all of them under ILN. But um, traditionally, all these have been uh, under the e-learning. So you can see some of the um, uh, 2020 new addition, uh, autonomous uh, uh, autom automotive cybersecurity, digital transformation, machine learning, AI standards, etc. Mm. So these are the categories under the e-learning. You can also see, well, aerospace, bioengineering, career development, communication. So you have both, well, technical skills and also soft skills as well. English for engineering is one of the popular course, and now actually this is the second phase. Uh, we have another um, version come up, English for technical professional. Top of standards, well, 
this is under the uh, fields uh, electromagnetics, power and, and energy, robotics, signal processing, etc. So if you look into that one, in this case, I have searched uh, artificial intelligence. So you returned me 17 modules. So transparency and accountability, the legal implementations issues, growth to grade, human emotions, deep learning, you got two. Okay, object visual recognition for intelligent systems. Okay. And then well, computational intelligence, again, I think something similar. Okay, natural information processing, methods and models, etc. <clears throat> so I know that, well, one of the comments is, okay, it still cost me for the um, ILN and uh, e-learning. Some of them may be free, uh, but uh, quite a number of them, are, they, 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 they do require a, a, a subscription or payment of the fees. But we do have some other well, sources well, which are free of charge as well. You can take a look at the Innovation at Work. There is, again, another website. In particular, because of the recent COVID-19 crisis, well, there are information and modules available on that, in particular, aiming to help uh, the academic to transit well, from the uh, traditional face-to-face uh, -face teaching to the online teaching. So, and also, you have some specific interests as well. I will show you the AI resources again. So looking at that one, well, you can see uh, some of these, some of the latest posts. <clears throat> so what, and then if I take a look at AI resources, so you just explain what is the background about AI and autonomous systems. And then these are some of the topics. Okay, again, the same thing. Well, edge computing, hacking, well, standards, internet of things. And these are some of the latest, well, discussion. Well, I would say in the in the present crisis, well, actually we provide a very good source of information through the um, COVID-19 uh, resource hub, and that is under the spectrum. So again, uh, they provide a list of the articles and, and resources. <clears throat> we take a good look at, at those things. So again, you can see all these topics, improving ethics in AI, well, shifting landscape in the age of AI, how AI can use, well, change the education and all those well, resources available. So now, I finish off with the educational resources. Uh, I mentioned on ILN, I mentioned about e-learning, I mentioned about innovation at work. Now let's turn our attention to another aspect, uh, which are the dedicated initiatives that have been funded uh, from IEEE for, for the past years. And then, well, I only highlight those. I put them under the categories of emerging technologies. So I believe that all of us, well, within the field of, of the study and the interest, I believe uh, you, you tend to agree with me. Well, this list of the emerging technologies, uh, they are feeling, well, the evolutions and the changes, well, in, in our technology. Artificial intelligence and related technologies, uh, learning and uh, analytic. So this is where the machine learning AI comes from. We also have the network and the uh, communication technology. They both attend, well, apply to the, to the wired, or wireless, and also we expect to come in the satellite technology as well. Brain technology is another one, although it's not yet come to full maturity, but a lot of work has been uh, interest have been in there. Uh, this is the one that investigates, well, in terms of the machine and human interface. Blockchain is another one. Uh, not so much just looking at the Bitcoin uh, type of um, application, but rather looking at more practical type of application, like in logistics, what we call practical uh, blockchains, uh, looking into um, healthcare is another good example. And I personally see that uh, blockchain could be applied uh, even to our volunteering, that we can have a record of a micro volunteering. And also we can have a record of micro credential on the education we have, we have gone through. So it's no longer just relied on your certificate well, on a four years or three years program. And also people have been collecting a whole bunch of uh, a certificate of attendance and certificate of completion, those kind of things. Rather, all the information can be put into a blockchain. It can be uh, transparent, it can be um, checked. But anyway, well, that one is still just a beginning. And then while well, talking about it, computer technology, that we see the challenge we have nowadays is really what we're limited by, by the Moore's law and the silicon base of system. But we have already witnessed, well, the development of the quantum computing and also well, some other uh, area of uh, development. So on the visualization, it's also a very important aspect the use of the virtual reality and the augmented reality, in in particular for for for, for teaching education and, and uh, diagnosis or training and all those things. Well, even I, if you take a look at my thesis, I do have uh, some students working on that, and it has been well, one of the um, 
the most cited paper as well. So if I take a look at some of these initiatives that uh, have been funded by NIC or New Initiatives Com Com uh, Committee in the past, as you can see the, the topics I'm referring to, well, and you see the early slides, we look at how uh, they feel the uh, full industrial revolution and also the percentage of paper within IEEE Explore. Now you understand why? Well, IEEE have the foresight that we have been supporting it well, right at the beginning. As you can see the IoT, we've funded from 2014 to 2016, well, to the amount of $1.36 million. Big data is the one, again, I mentioned about all the machine learning and all those things. And have been funded well for around close a million dollars between 2015 and 2017. Cybersecurity is another one, around close 700,000. All this time I was in a committee, so I'm fully aware well, of the details of, of those who are funding and the proposal, etc. Rebooting computing is the one that looking at the new era of computing, brain initiatives, well, digital reality. All this you can see from minimum half a million to close a million dollars have been funded. So Looking at the resources, so you can take a look at another important committee within IEEE called the Future Direction Committee. This one is under the Technical Activities Board. So a lot of those initiatives you have seen earlier on actually are led by them, funded by New Initiatives Committee. So they have this uh, particular website talking about the articles and the blogs. So they have a tech cloud on the left-hand side. As you can see, the one come up prominently is the artificial intelligence. Most are being spoken on that part. And some others, like the autonomous well, system, autonomous vehicles, and then digital transformation, looking okay, at digital twin. So I'm now referring to all these initiatives now. Uh, again, I would act as a pointer to show to you well, the websites. And I, I encourage you, if you're interested in those initiatives, take a good look at it and see how you can involve, uh, involve with that. Not only just simply as a receiver in getting the information, but they do invite participation in the communities and also within the working group in the, in the technical committee, etc. So you can see some explanation. Well, what is this uh, uh, initiative all about? Like brain, uh, like the uh, blockchain. So there are more than crypto well, currency, but rather it is just a te uh, technological foundation for conducting transactions, well, securing network and recording the validity and the origins of data. So it allows a new perspective and how humans interact to the society challenge. So you allow point to point, you don't need to go for a center, um, uh, mediators or control. Touching upon everything from financial transaction, energy trading, carbon emissions, protections, and, and easy access to healthcare records, and also the value access to operation in a national states. Well, logistic is another one. I also mentioned some application, could be in education, could be in the certification, credential, etc. Brain initiatives. This one is dedicated to advancing technologies that improve an understanding of brain function, revolutionizing current abilities to reverse engineering the neural circuits in both the central and the peripheral nervous systems, and develop the new approaches to interface the brain with machines for augmenting human-machine interaction and meditating uh, the, effective, the effects of neurological disease and injury. So we can see it covers quite a fair bit. Well, you can uh, tap the, the signal well, from the human being, like the brain wave or some other bio uh, data. They can provide information, like diagnosis as well, like what we call the effective uh, computing, looking into the emotions. So, and also, when well, you help the people, they may be well, mobility challenged, well, they, they are not able to, to move. Then we can use the brain wave as a, as a means or mechanism for control. So you can see the potential is great. Some others, uh, like the uh, digital uh, reality, so this is the one that well, enabling the coming digital transformation through the collaboration between the technologists, engineers, regulators, and uh, ethicists. So talking about topics like AI, machine learning, augmented realities, virtual realities, and then we see that uh, the integration and between the physical world and also digital world. Future networks, this is in particular dealing with the um, with the communication part. Okay, so it really dedicated to bring together researchers, scientists, engineers from industry, ac academia, and government around the world to solve the challenges associated with the development and deployment of the next generation network infrastructure. You will see that AI also beginning will have a part to play in the networking, like the spectrum, um, like the spectrum allocations, and also while looking at the software-defined network, well, those who are having the involvement of the software 
base of algorithm in driving them. Quantum is, is another one. They serve as a leading community of all project activities on quantum technology. I understand the prototype of the first quantum computing has already been in place. So it's going to be very fascinating well, development. Well, if quantum computing is going to be used, although the, the people getting concerned in terms of security, uh, that's another topic we're going to talk about. But rebooting computing, so six to rethink the computer from soup to nuts. Well, you put all aspect from device to the user interface. And the group works from holistic view pointing into account evolutionary and revolutionary approaches. So you will see that it's not only just on the phenomenon architecture we have relied for all these years, but rather we expect to see some fundamental change, not only just simply algorithm itself, but also the architecture and the devices and the materials. So all these individual initiatives, you can look into their specific websites. You can see that what is involved. Well, what are the out, well, outcomes they have developed over the years? So you can see in here, under the blockchain.itrb.org, well, you can see a similar setup, well, like the home of it, but what is it all, uh, who are in the communities? So if anyone are interested in that, well, you should really explore how you can be involved in the communities. And also like the conferences, education, resources, publications, etc. Next one is the brain initiatives. You got the same thing, okay? You got an also similar setup. But one of the important work for brain initiative is support of the hackathon. Uh, when we run the system maintenance of Atlantic conference, it's, it's not uncommon for a few years where we run a one-year hackathon before the major conference. And I know that it's also happening in the other conferences as well. Digital reality, as you have seen the description earlier on, talking about digital trends in cooperation of VR, AR. Future network, I talk about beyond 5G now. Also, a similar well, arrangement as well. Featured um, articles, well, technological uh, highlights, quantum. Okay, so you have the um, quantum week uh, later in the year. Reporting computing. Now, this is the one I'm going to talk about very shortly, about the roadmaps coming out well, from the initiative. Although the roadmap has been around for a few years, and actually, I think back in 2015, they've already got an early edition being published. So I'm going to talk about this one shortly. Big data, uh, in particular, anyone dealing with machine learning, AI, you cannot re really get away today that you have all the deep learning algorithm. You have the, the resources available on the cloud well, from Microsoft, from Google. And also, you've been using tools like the MATLAB. You've been writing programs using R. Well, you're using all type of different development. So all this, ultimately, you need to work on data. So through this initiative, one of the major and I consider significant well, outcome is the development of the data port website. So as you can see in here, so it is a one-stop shop, data repository serving the growing technical community on big data. So what is it? If you take a look at rgv-dataport.org, this is what you find but under the data port, explain what is it all about. It enable you to hold data up to two terabyte open access. So it's very important for us to work on the uh, machine learning, all those things. We need some data for experiment. And I know that you can get well data from um, from, uh, from UCI, uh, I think UCI is it, the University of California. They have some repository. Uh, people working on um, signal processing, they've been using this picture called Lisa for, for many years already. So but really for big data, you need to have the availability of different applications and different sources of uh, data. So if you go to this, this is what you find out. So you have a data set, you can search it. On the left-hand side, you can see the different categories and the number of data sets available in it. You can see AI, 140 data set. Astronomy, five. Biomedical data and health sciences, 111. The biophysiological signals, 54, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a power, then also give you some little bit more description, okay, underwater images, well, power generation, well, antenna, Again, you can see all this continue. Computational intelligence, computer vision, even COVID-19 as well, well, geoscience data, image processing, well, some others, power and, and energy, et cetera, et cetera. So you can really take a look and you can even submit a data set as well. Okay, then you can have an introduction so assessing the data set. So some others like the IoT, okay, Internet of Things, uh, even though well, the funding has uh, finished in 2017, but you can see it's still available, it's still very active. Cybersecurity is another one. And in particular, I would like to draw the attention that uh, one of the major outcomes from the work is on the 
um, on, on the AI and machine learning for cybersecurity. Although this one was published, you know, even looking now close to three years ago, but it still is very relevant. It is not limited to just a technical aspect, but rather looking into some kind of roadmap and they set out how encourage the, the involvement of the of the academics, industry, and also the government uh, addressing the issues of cybersecurity. So let's finish uh, another part talking about the initiatives. And coming to my last part now, I'm aiming to finish all my talk in one and a half hours or so. So you're talking about technology roadmaps. So what are they? I also consider this is an, another part quite a little well known and not too much people talk about this. And a lot of these roadmaps has been the products of the support from the initiatives, well, sp sponsored by the new initiative committee. And I strongly believe that, well, this information should be much more widely publicized and people can make good use of it. It can range from, a, from you being a student or being academic and also the industry, uh, government as well, because they are not concentrating just on technical. Unlike the paper in Explore, whereby that you see all oh, people writing on the algorithm, writing on the data, writing on the results. But this is looking at much more holistic and uh, looking at the overview of the whole, whole issue. So that's why I consider it is important. You can take a look at this roadmap under the roadmap.rgv.org. So you, this is the website you see, and you might have already seen this uh, logo for the IRDS, which again, I'll talk a little bit well, earlier on. So the roadmap actually is managed well under this uh, uh, IEEE roadmap um, the commu uh, committee, uh, which was um, started off with some kind of an ad hoc community earlier on, back in 2018. The main objective is trying to oversee the coordination and the development of the IEEE across well, the whole spectrum. And then we'll have some standardization of the, and the process, procedures, and the templates, etc. So in uh, early this year, it's supposed to be transit to the roadmaps committee. So the goals and objective. Well, you started off as an ad hoc. Um, so you seek to support with the roadmap act activities through the building of the infrastructure, creation of the policy, procedures and guidelines, and also I have the roadmap of user groups that they are the one providing the input and the feedback. So to develop the templates and the checklist and also centralize the information and the, the distribution of the roadmaps. And this is what you see. So these are the current roadmaps available already. And there's some, well, under development. I'm going to pick up just a few of these. I'm going to talk about the networking generations um, roadmap and talk about the neural technologies, uh, brain, machine interfacing, and I'll talk about the ILDS as well, okay? Well, most of these, they are full, full set of roadmaps are available, all the documents. A lot of those, they also have the reports from the working group as well. It's quite comprehensive, a lot of information inside there. So if you take a look at those, I started off by looking at the International Network Generation Roadmap, INGLs. Uh, this is the one well supported well, under the um, future um, uh, uh, under future network initiatives. Okay, so this is the one as you can see in here, available exclusive to sign participant of the initiative. So you need to be part of it as well as part of the chapter. So of course there's some. If you are society members, in that case it will be free. Otherwise, well, five dollars for the student members, ten dollars for the um, non-members, and fifteen dollars for non IEEE members. So this is what you see. You have the executive summary, okay? I think the executive summary is free. I got a whole, 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 whole one myself. Or you can sign up as a member if you're an IEEE member. So inside there, you're looking at the different aspects, application and services, edge, uh, hardware, uh, multi-input, multi-output, the massive, satellites, standard, etc. But also a couple of the white papers available. And then take a look at all the more details based on the table of content. Now, I'm not going through all this. I leave it to you if you're interested. But what I'm trying to do is just to point the information to you. And then, well, you can get involved as well as the working group. And this is their, their interest for the different areas, application and, serv and services, deployment, energy efficiency, massive MIMO, security, system optimizations, and also some other resources, the webinar, podcasts, et cetera. So this is the one on I. And GR. Next, this is the one to be closer to anyone interested in brain. So this is the one, the brain machine interfacing under the neural technologies for the brain machine interfacing. So you bring together all the uh, stakeholders, the industries, and try to identify the issue, establish the standards. So they are currently actually asking for input and feedback, and they open is all the way up to uh, September this year.
So you can get involved, okay, from different aspects. And they have, again, got a, the reports uh, has been um, available online as well. So inside the report, well, you'll see the content um, later on. Well, this is, this, this is the um, uh, expected outcome, well, from the work. Okay, so uh, I, I didn't give a copy of the content in here. Okay, the last one is the IRDS, okay, the in International Roadmap on the Devices and Systems. So this is the 2020 edition. We got a two early edition as well. You can download the whole lot entirely free of charge. So it is a set of predictions that serve as the successor to the IP, ITRS, uh, the International um, I think Network on, this, on this, uh, Semiconductors. I, I remember the, this word the S stands for. So the simplified economic manufacturing supply and research coordination well, regarding the development of electronic devices and systems. Now, I know that today's talking about AI and machine. Well, they, they, you may think that it may not be uh, relevant, but bear in mind that well, some of the development on AI actually goes on to the device or system on the chips, okay? And especially looking into the edge technology. So we are expecting that a lot of our algorithm can be implemented in chips, well, on the edge, uh, uh, right at the front end of the data collection and do the data analysis right at the front end. So on that aspect, well, it will be related well, to your interest in AI and machine learning. So the goal is to identify the key trends. I, I really want to highlight, well, in terms of the, of the uh, outlook, is looking at 15 years uh, horizon. So what it means is give you well, plenty of things to look forward to in terms of the research direction and uh, what you really want to engage on. If you're even looking in the industry, you want to do your own startup, then you can identify well, what are the gaps, uh, how you can develop on that part. To determine the generic devices and the system needs, the challenges, potential solutions, and opportunities for innovation. And to encourage the related well, activities worldwide and through the collaborative uh, events, such as the conferences and roadmap workshops. So this is, has been one of the uh, we uh, funding well, objectives. Well, we fund the events not only so we do not fund basic research as such, but we want to fund well for the events. It can be a catalyst well for those uh, related work. So you can see the societies where you involved. Well, I mentioned about the computer society in here. Some others, well, councils and, and, and societies. So if you download well the whole edition, just the. Executive summary itself, I think it's 64 free pages. So you give it an overview of what is it all about. You can download the whole thing. Well, I, I find it's very comprehensive, it's really useful. And looking at some of the historic background and also the forecast in the future. And then you can have the individual reports uh, from the individual team, uh, what they call the ITFT, uh, International Focus Team. So I'm not sure you can read it, the word or not, like application benchmarking, system and architecture, outside system connectivity, yield enhancement. Now you may or may not be, well, directly dealing with those, so it doesn't matter, you don't, you don't need to, but just at least we'll take a look at the executive uh, summary and give an overview of the whole thing's all about. So they also have uh, papers, we talk about more than more. So what it means is, well, you'd expect to see, well, what happened well, if we go beyond Moore's law? So on the system and architecture, on the working report, they're talking about the emerging trend, the cloud, the mobile, internet of things, or cyber physical systems. So more or less, let's finish all my talk now. I, I, I'm over an hour or so. So I would say that, well, the summary of my, uh, for the past um, 90 minutes or so, I've been looking at the AI and machine learning are the engine and key technologies in the next industry and business revolution. So all of us, we expect for things no longer to be the same. So on one hand, we see that the, the COVID-19 is causing a lot of disruption, but we also see there's a lot of opportunity. We also expect to see a lot of changes as well. And we, we believe there's gonna be changes for the better. And also RGB is dedicated to the provision of educational services and resources to enhance public understanding and career professional development of the members. Okay, so again, you can see that there's so much information and then well, uh, in IEEE um, uh, spectrum and environment that the people can get access to. And it's such a pity that people are not aware of the availability of all those information. And then the IEEE Future Direction Committee, the New Initiatives Committee, Standard Association, and the Roadmaps Committees have been instrumental in establishing leading edge resources, initiatives, standards, and future direction on emerging technologies and development. 
So in particular, I highlight well the importance of AI and machine learning under all these areas. And you can see they are behind well uh, most of these well areas. So once again, I, I'm really proud to say that uh, being a member of IEEE, and I repeat the mission and the tagline that we have, we are advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. So I finish off with my presentation now, and uh, I thank you very much well, for your attention, and I wish everyone well in the audience a success with your research and your study and your work in AI and machine learning. And op opportunities there, and uh, the, as they always say, well, the world is, the, is your oyster. Okay, thank you. And now I pass the time back to the host, okay? Thank you, Professor. So Thank now we'll go for some yeah, questions. Okay. okay. Uh, so may I encourage you, if you have any question, that please type it on the chat box so that I can read it. I can try to answer yeah. it as much as I could. Yes, okay. Yeah, post it in the chat box. So is there any scope for research in digital image processing in IEEE? Okay, yeah. okay, I'm trying to read some of the uh, question now. So are the data sets available in the IEEE data port uh, having free access? Well, I believe they are. So take a look at that, okay? I, I'm not 100% sure for all the data set, but I, I encourage you to, to, to explore it yourself. Is there any scope of research in digital image processing in IEEE environments? Yes, well, take a look at signal processing society, and also even taking a look at uh, a lot of deep learning, or those things are working on image processing. Okay, so uh, we are attending all the sessions. Please share the address of the speaker to express feedback to the end. Okay, I'll leave it to you to handle the feedback. Are okay, the data so sets available in IEEE data port having free access? It's a very good question. So could you suggest some related resources provide open set data for machine learning and deep learning? Take a look at the data port, okay? And also take a look at... Um, I think the UCI is it? Uh, I cannot recall exactly the full name of it. And they do have some other data set um, that people were using. Another one you can take a look is, when you look at the research papers, take a look at what, what are the sources of their data set. And that's how you can find out from there, all right? So I, I, I can't really give you offhand, because I, I have my students, say for example, my student been working on some machine learning and recommendation. Well, we use the um, uh, some information about the movies uh, from Netflix. So you just try it out. Well, personally, I do not really actively working on, on those data set. I leave it to the student. So, but as I said, take a look at the research papers. The research papers should be able to give the, the, the information on the source of the, info, of the data. So, so what do you suggest some reliable sources providing open data sets for machine learning and deep learning? I've already said it already, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So take a look at, at the uh, data ports, okay, with IEEE. Are there some yeah, open yeah. data available? Yes. Yes, well, uh, Echo already answered you already. There are some open data available in UCI. Yes. Okay. So I think there is no more questions from the audience. So let me wind up this session. So thank you, Professor, for delivering a, such a beautiful and uh, extensive lecture on IEEE, the different activities and different functionalities of IEEE. And uh, being computer science professional or students, we should know about more about IEEE. And I request all of you be a member of IEEE uh, Society. And uh, uh, the professor, he explained about the length and breadth of IEEE, about the society members and educational and technical resources available, which are even free for the, um, I mean, for the users. And uh, he explained about how to access the lifelong learning resources and the educational programs, which are particularly designed to connect throughout an individual's life. And under the IEEE learning networks, he said the recent course programs which are available like blockchain, cybersecurity, 5G networks, artificial neural network, ACE computing, IEEE uh, e-learning, etc. And also he explained about uh, like uh, e-learning library available in Ex uh, Explore, IEEE Explore, and also he uh, said IEEE techno uh, discussed about the IEEE technology roadmaps um, like a heterogeneous integration roadmap 
and IEEE international network generation roadmaps. And uh, if uh, if you become a member of IEEE, um, you can avail all these uh, uh, all these facilities, all these opportunities. Mm, even if uh, some of the uh, functionalities or some of the programs, some of the uh, uh, articles like society. Um, uh, society uh, stops are available for uh, the members. I mean, for everyone, even though you are not a member of IEEE, you can avail those facilities. And uh, the emerging technology, what he highlighted, uh, the brain technology, blockchain technology, computer technology, virtual reality and augmented reality technology, learning and analytical technology. So all of these, I mean, now you people are working, most of you are working in this area. So you can get the latest uh, uh, work available uh, from IEEE uh, resource. And uh, also, he explained about the IEEE future directions, technical communi communities. So they have uh, the future directions. They have kept blockchain, brain, digital reality, and future networks. So all of this, you can, uh, I mean, you have a very uh, exhaustive uh, uh, data bank or resource available in IEEE. So you can access. In addition to this, there is a data port available, which is also free. And you, all of you can uh, make use of that. So with all this, I, I mean, uh, getting all, all, all this information from Professor uh, Fung, I would again like to extend a heartfelt thanks on behalf of North Florida University, the entire fraternity, academic fraternity of North Florida University, as well as on behalf of all the participants uh, joining this program. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. Good luck. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. And uh, welcome back, viewers. So now we are moving to our last session of today's program. So, last session will be uh, delivered by uh, will be addressed by Professor Vanapati Panda. Already you have heard him yesterday, and today his topic is application of deep learning and CNN in healthcare. I think um, many of you must have started working on uh, deep learning technology, which is the thrust area right now. So I think uh, if you attend, definitely you will get a lot of information about deep learning because he is a uh, very i mean spontaneous spoke, uh, speaker and has a lot of knowledge and i mean experience about the uh, artificial intelligent techniques so definitely you will be benefited from his talk so thank you all again i request all of you to join exactly 10 minutes before to three o'clock 3 p.m. So until then, goodbye. Thank you. If you have any questions in between, please post in the chat box so we could be able to answer all the questions during the third session. Thank you. <laughs>